All right, Larry, I wanted to say first, thanks for hanging out today. Uh, we, uh, we are ourselves, I got introduced to you just not even maybe a week ago, you popped on a live stream I was doing and, and, uh, in a short order, I realized that we have a whole lot in common, which is kind of cool because it's kind of hard to find somebody who has that many things in common, uh, with another person because of the yeah. autograph collector we talked about, the selling on eBay, the, uh, TTMing, you know, the, uh, movie, uh, just being uh, fascinated with film and, and all that. And so I guess the real question I have to start out with was when did you, when did you get on YouTube and, uh, when did you, when you got on YouTube, what was your focus at that time? Uh, probably got on YouTube a couple years ago and it was basically, well, probably like four or five years ago to promote my movies. You know, I was doing, uh, you know, like, Go, not GoFundMe, but the uh, Indiegogo, you know, campaigns mm -hmm. and and just you know, having my uh, you know trailers up and stuff like that. But then I started get on YouTube go with like the resale channel and stuff. But and now like I'm doing the TTMs with the res resale channel and stuff. But. So I know that I've been going through your channel, and I'm by no means a uh, Oh, Henry S. said, Larry in the house. Um, uh, but I know that I've been going through your channel, and I'm not, by, like I said, uh, no expert quite yet, but I've been going through a lot of your videos. But the TTM, and we discussed this off camera before, seems to be a pretty, uh, a pretty big source of uh, entertainment for you. And then you've been like you uh, looting, looting and pillaging all of uh, – the United States of America based on your TTM and uh, conquest you've been doing. So talk a little bit about that because just today you were taught, you were showing me the, the plunder that is TTM. So let's, I'd like to hear a little bit about that if you don't mind. Well, in October, uh, I started collecting TTM again. I, I'd been watching you know, some channels like uh, Michael Myers and J uh, Brandon Stebbins was watching those guys, you know, get these autographs back. And I used to do it back in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, I really enjoyed it. It was like Christmas every day. You know, you wake up and, and check your mail and you got, you know, 50 packages, you know, or something like that. But uh, I watched for about six months and I decided I wanted to start doing it for myself. So I started doing it and then... I decided to start doing the YouTube channel at the same time just to show people my journey because I just started. And also, uh, you know, I wasn't getting as much resale content because of COVID. So I couldn't really go out to the thrift stores and, you know, do videos while I'm out at the thrift stores and stuff. I didn't feel comfortable, you know, because of COVID. So I didn't go to 30 thrift stores a day like I used to, you know. So it, plus I enjoyed it. It was fun and uh, it's kind of like an unboxing every day. You know, right. That's true. So and did today you I got notice for yourself, 43. Go ahead. By the way. No, go ahead. What was that? I said I got 43 returns. 43 returns today. 43 returns in TTM. Is that what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 40. Have you already went? Have you already went through all 43 of them, or or no? Yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, just shot the video like two minutes ago. Nice. So in your experience, since you said you started doing this back in October, the TTMing, <clears throat> have you noticed at all a uh, a pattern with any of the TTMing you're doing? I know back initially when the whole COVID thing began, people were saying TTM might end up being a, a horrible hobby to be in because people were scared of TTM. Uh, you, you're dealing with lots of older people, you know, celebrities, uh, sports stars, whatever, and they were scared to like do TTM through the mail. What has your experience been? Like Obviously, a, 43 is pretty good. Yeah, you just find the guys that sign because I've noticed a lot of guys that used to sign before I got in the hobby, you know, signed like a year ago, but they're not signing now because they're afraid of the COVID probably. But then I see some of these guys, they're getting returns back. You know, I've been seeing a lot of people get Sean Dunstan back and people sent to him two years ago. So, you know, maybe they'll come back on board, you know, when they're 
less scared of it or they're vaccinated or whatever they they're getting done. Sure. I'm hoping. You know? I got I got sets to finish. <laughs> So what? So what's your strategy then when you do TTMing? Are you are you just looking at what? At what first? What's your source of TTMing? And are you looking at anybody who's autographing? Are you trying to find you know people that aren't getting getting a return or like unused addresses and trying to give it a shot and be the first one out the door trying to get use that address? Or are you trying to use the ones that have already been proven? A mixture, like. like there's been times where, you know, I've sent to guys that have no response for the past year or eight months or something like nobody sent to them. Uh, like some USFL guys, you know, some of those guys might not have any cards except for that set. So if you're not working on that set, you're not going to send to that third string guy that played for the bandits or something, you know? So sure. I, I've had good luck with some of those. And I've also went to one of my, my sources to find addresses that aren't on the, the, the sites is just go to whitepages.com. And if you go to their Wikipedia page, you can find out who their parents, not their parents are, who their wives are sometimes. And that will tell you on white pages, you know, related to so-and-so. And you kind of know the age they are. And you kind of know where they used to mm -hmm. live. If they're from Scottsdale, Arizona, you can say, oh, okay, he used to live in Scottsdale. That's probably the guy. You know, right. so that's that's a real good source, you know, that and is, you can get some like, those most some of those are private. Addresses. You know, some of those yeah. are private addresses that aren't on the sites. So I've had good luck with the, the yeah. two or three guys I've done that with, you know. Yeah, doing the, doing the work is the always secrets. nice. <laughs> right. Don't give away all the trade secrets. Right. Yeah. Well, that's always that slippery slope in the TTM community because, you know, a lot of people, they want to be the ones who can say, well, I did the work. I'm not telling anybody how I got this autograph. I'm just going to show it off and then tell you I'm not helping you to get that as well. <clears throat> if you want it, you got to go figure it out yourself. There's a lot of that that goes on the TTM world, which kind of, you know, puts a bad taste in my mouth because, you know, I'm not asking for the autograph. I'm not asking right. for the address, but you can at least, you can at least tell people – you know, the source you used and let the other person like, you know, uh, try to figure it out themselves. But just to kind of like dangle the carrot kind of gets like to me, it's kind right. of a like like an un unfortunate part of the, the TTM hobby uh, for sure. <clears throat> so you said you've been I mean, obviously you got like 46 responses back. You I know you tell me privately, but publicly. What is usually your output, your output weekly or monthly since October to recently? I try to send a minimum of a hundred letters out a week, and then I sent a hundred letters out seven a week. days ago. Five. Yeah. You said five hundred. Yeah. So in seven days, if you send out 500 letters, you can get 43 requests back. <laughs> right. So here's a question for you. It says, how many T teams do you have out right now? Like, how many do you think you have out right now that have not come back from Gary? Oh, man. Probably a lot. but I would say, like... I think since October, I've sent out probably 2,400 requests. Wow. And I would say, you know, except for the ones I wrote like last week, because I've only got like 50 or 60 of those so far, because I got some the day before yesterday too. I got like 15 or something already on the sixth day or fifth day, you know, but, uh, I would say I probably got fifteen hundred or two thousand back. So wow. I'm only waiting on maybe five six hundred now, maybe. That's awesome. Now, do you do mostly like sports stars? Are you doing celebrities? Are you doing like World War Two veterans? Are you doing astronauts? Like, what is it? Anybody and everybody? Or are you like have a focus? Well, I'm trying to put every set together from 1950 to 1995. Uh, 
baseball, football, and basketball right now. Uh, I'm also going to send out some golf. I've sent out some wrestling. I've sent out a few celebrities, not very many. Uh, NASCAR, I've sent out to them, but I'm not really concentrating on the NASCAR. I'm just going to find out who signs and kind of send to those guys because I don't really know the sets and our way to get all the sets. And you, you have to put a limit on something, you know what I mean? <laughs> you can't collect every right. single thing. So, no, it's impossible. Uh, but I'm going to find out. Yeah. Yeah, Henry, you're, that, just to answer your question, to, to follow up what you said, Henry, that's when I was doing TTM in the last couple of years, that's how I do like about five a week. I can't keep up with it more than that. Obviously, uh, Larry here is a machine, just like Brian Cage, and uh, can do 100 a week or whatever, but that's that's nuts. I can't do it. But obviously, the returns are pretty nice. And then uh, Gary had another question. Big Scott, he wanted to know, do you ever get concerned that the wife or the kids or whatever, you know, they're doing the autographing for dad or whoever you might be sending to? No. I did get an autograph from uh, one of the player's granddaughters, though. Uh, she, she like, wrote on my, like, return envelope or something, her name or something, and then uh, the after this is my granddaughter Chloe's autograph or something. She was helping <laughs> granddad do TTM or something. <laughs> that's awesome. That's cool. It's pretty cool. So that's pretty cool. That's yeah, that's, 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 that's probably... Jackson. Yeah, that's that's funny. Yeah, I heard about Phil Jackson's kids or grandkids signed for him. I've heard that in the past, actually. I don't know why I heard that, but I have heard yeah. that. Um, so I've I know you, like that. I said again, yeah, well, now you know that if you do, that apparently his grandkids might sign for him. So be careful. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you two questions. One has what on, on the TTM in front before we move to something else, what's been your biggest surprise, uh, return and what's been your biggest, uh, re uh, you know, uh, denial or, or sad, sad, uh, denied return. So far, I'd say some of the disappointing ones are, uh, you know, the guys that I sent to, and then like seven days later they die. You know, those those yeah. are kind of, you know, sad. You know, uh, it happened to me on Paul Horning. I wasn't able to get him. Uh, it happened to me on uh, Herb Adderley. Uh, you know, some of these Ooh. recent Hall of Famers that have just died. You know. I wasn't able to get in in time, but uh, as far as I'm not really sure as far as like best success, you know, because pretty much most of the people I send to have successful rates, you know, so you know you're going to get them back. Okay. I did. So I did get like uh, uh, like I, I was able to get Archie Manning pretty quick, so. I was happy to get that. But, that you know, like cool. most of the guys, you know, like the Hall of Fame, you know, like the Hall of Famers that charge money and stuff, you know, you're going to get them back, you know, normally. Like yeah, at least you hope so, right? Sonny Jurgensen's back and uh, Lynn Dawson's. Yeah, I mean, there's some that's got lost in the mail. Like I had four get lost, four cards and 20 bucks get lost to Frank Thomas. I wrote him a letter and asked him, you know, if he, if they ever showed up there and he said no because he keeps a log of everybody that sends to him and my address had never, you know, sent to him before. So it got lost in the mail. I lost 20 bucks and, you know, four wow. 1950 cards, you know? So, but it's right. just, that's part of the hobby. You know, you're going to lose, sure. you're going to lose some stuff. Sure. That very, very true. So I know that you mentioned uh, in the past, again, talking to me, I'm sure you mentioned maybe on your channel, but that you kind of got started into this, this whole resell or cards or just kind of like just a hobby venture you know years years ago you know you had like a brick and mortar physical store or whatever like kind of talk about that like how you got from you know how, how you got into that to yeah. where you're at today uh well in the very beginning you know i started doing card shows like in the mid 80s Mm -hmm. And uh, from there on, like in 1990, I opened up my own shop. 
and I had a shop off and on till 2007. And pretty good. I ended up uh, sold everything I owned at 2007. You know, all my cards, all my TTM, everything. And like I said, I regretted selling my TTM. So that's why now, like I said, I don't sell my stuff. You know, I just I just collect it. So because uh, I had to sell all my stuff before because I had a card shop, you know. So now, you know, I just collect it because I want to collect it, you know. Sure. Not because, you know, I'm trying to make a profit or anything. You know, I, you know, I have sold stuff in the past. Cause I had a card shop, you know, I had a sure. card shop for 20 years. Well, and that was in Ohio. I've been doing eBay full time since 97. 97. Yeah. Well, Ohio and West Virginia. West Virginia. Okay. Now you had told me that uh, years ago, a handful of years ago, you were set up at a show, you're doing something. And then uh, you, uh, you had uh, done some filmmaking and so, um, tell us, I want, I'm definitely interested about that. I'm definitely interested in like talking to somebody who's done some filmmaking. You've worked with some pretty notable characters, either character actors type people, like you said, or characters as, as far as their characters in the wrestling ring. And I just kind of like to know a little bit about that. Like how did that, how did those situations come about? Cause you know, that's something that. You know, uh, no, normal run of the mill, you know, fan collector is not going to be doing. Well, it all started probably seven years ago, maybe. Uh, I was a zombie in the Pro Wrestlers vs. Zombies movie that had uh, Roddy Piper, Kurt Angle, Matt Hardy, Rebby Sky, Shane Douglas. Uh, Jim Duggan, <coughs> I had Playboy Playmate, uh, no, it was a penthouse play pet, um, but yeah, I was, I was an extra, basically, in that movie, I played a zombie, and, you know, just, I got the film bug from that, you know, so I thought, you know, I can do this, so I went out and bought a nice camera, and a year later, uh, I contacted Hacksaw because that night, you know, while we were filming, I got his information. You know, I'd met Hacksaw before. He was always been a cool guy. So uh, mm -hmm. he said, I got his, his business card, called him up and said, uh, Hacksaw, this is, you know, Larry. Uh, you know, we met, we were in the movie together and we met at the premiere and stuff. Uh, are you interested in being in my movie? And uh, we negotiated a price and he said, yeah, I'll be in the movie. So. Uh, the first movie we made was The Axeman in Henderson County, and we filmed it in seven days. We had uh, Hacksaw come in for one day. All his scenes took, we started about 9 o'clock in the morning. We finished at about 3, 3.30. Uh, we went over, had some dinner, and bs with him for like an hour and a half. The dude has like tremendous stories. He was actually at my Peddler's Junction store, because I have, I was told, told you I, I had a uh, physical location. And, uh, we hung out there. He was in the wrestling section for about an hour, hour and a half, just looking at the wrestling, you know, DVDs and stuff I had and some of the autographs I had there. But uh, he was a good dude. So then after we filmed that movie, we uh, made another movie. Actually, we made a couple movies after that that we never finished, you know, because when you're doing independent, you know, movies, you can't you can't afford to really pay anybody. And yeah. like I said, the Indiegogo's, you yeah. make, you know, like maybe $200 or something. So you're not going to really film a great movie for like 200 bucks, you know? So it's hard to get stuff scheduled. It's hard to get people to want to give up, you know, their time. Your time's precious, you know? And to make yeah. a movie, the first one took us seven days, but we filmed 18 hours a day. You know, we filmed around the clock pretty much. And pretty much everybody donated their the time except Hacksaw. You know, we paid Hacksaw. But uh like I said, we had a couple projects that for some reason or another, you know, didn't we couldn't finish. So then we made this mockumentary. And it's kinda like some of the stuff we went through as as filmmakers, you know, some of the funny things we went through or some of the sad things we went through that we just thought would be funny and we wanted to kinda give a little jab or, you know, a little just you know just make a funny movie, just crazy, zany. Sure. Basically, after watching 
um, our first movie. The only thing I loved about our first movie, I mean, I liked some of it, but like I said, the only thing I love about it is the gag reel. So I'm sitting there watching the gag reel one day, and I'm like, why can't I just make a gag reel movie? So basically, uh, I wanted to make a gag reel movie, and that's what the Bung Fodders is. Uh, it's just a movie that is funny, it's hilarious, and it's, it's like all the bad stuff. All that stuff you love to watch in the gag reels, that's what it is. I call it a gag reel movie. It's just, it's funny. And Cage does a great job. Cage is in it, and, it, and he's just hilarious. And uh, yeah. we have Zach Galligan from Gremlins in it. Yeah. It's hilarious. His part's hilarious, too. Uh, Zach That's didn't awesome. know that we were characters. And we never told him we were characters. We just told him it was uh-huh. a documentary. And, you know, he signed our, like, permission or whatever, you know, so he could be in the movie and, and we just let him go on thinking that we were just crazy people, you know. <laughs> but uh, it was. They said Cage, Cage, and I were set up against. Well, I was telling you privately that, you know, for five. Oh, it might be almost seven years now, but at least it's been at least five years ago that I've been filming independent wrestling. You know, all different kinds of federations and stuff. And part of my payment for setting up at the or. Part of my payment for filming was I got a free table to set up at the shows, at the wrestling shows, and I could sell my wrestling autographs, and I could sell, uh, you know, my movies and stuff. And, you know, I usually made okay money, you know, some of those shows. But And I enjoyed filming. You know, like I said, I was a filmmaker, so I enjoyed filming stuff, too. I mean, I, I really wanted to try to get the best thing. Yeah, Brian Cage. Yeah. He, uh, if you don't know who he is, go to YouTube. Look up Lucha Underground or AEW. The dude is a machine, just like me. That's why. That's why I had Ryan Cage. We're machines. I'm a TTM machine. He's a just a machine machine. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. And uh, they said we also have Cool Duder from YouTube. Uh, Sean cool Cooper Duder. Is in oh. the movie yeah. And we have. Uh, hey guys. Yeah, Sean C's hey guys. The crap. Yeah, <laughs> he does. He does like a five minute scene. It's hilarious. Uh, we also have uh, Jordan Patton, who was third on Face Off like a few years ago. Uh, uh-huh. We got a girl that was like a cage dancer in the original. Uh, like I so said, we have a great cast in that movie. Considering sure. uh, I only had fifty bucks in that movie, and and that kind of cast is is amazing. I mean, it's just. You know, but I've always, I used to be a, like a player agent, like a sports marketing agent for players. So I, uh, I know how to get things done and get people and, and stuff like that, you know? That's awesome. Well, it's one of the things I noticed because I became good friends. Uh, I was really heavily, heavily into it for about a decade into the, the, uh, convention scene with mostly like, uh, film celebrities and I got to I got to work behind yeah. the scenes with a couple of the promotions that come through Indianapolis, and I became good friends with a lot of the actors. I mean, you know, and I'm we're talking about actors who were still acting, you know, in movies. Like we're talking about, you know, I, uh, the independent movies or even Hollywood, you know, movies. They were still in, in those, um, like you know, uh, Ken Foray, mm-hmm. for instance, you know, uh, Gunnar Hansen. Some of those bigger names, Zach, Gall- Zach Galligan, like you mentioned, a few of the other ones. I'm trying to think of a few of the other guys that I, I, I kind of ran, I ran with. Uh, Bill Mosley, a lot of those guys, and they're the first. They're the first ones to tell you they're, they're just there to have a good time and have fun. They'll, they'll cut like you were saying. They'll cut like little promos. They'll cut little scenes in movies just to goof off while they're hanging around at the at the mm-hmm. show. You know, they don't have any egos. You know, they don't have any like. There was no prima donna attitudes with them, you know. It was, it was always a good time. I mean, obviously, I never saw them from the the business aspect of it, you know. But people would approach them all the time and say, "Hey, you know, would you do this little thing for my movie?" And I mean, most times they would say yes. I mean, it was it was very cool to see them just be that fan friendly. Yeah. See, we had uh, Vernon Wells from Command and uh, wow. weird science and stuff. 
He cut her. <laughs> well, he, was he wearing like that? Was he wearing that, that chainmail ja- chain shirt in the video? <laughs> but it was cool, man. It was like, literally, he is the best actor I've ever filmed because I'm sitting there filming the video and I'm just like, like having goosebumps because I was like, man, this dude is because he went from like, like happy to sad to like crazy all in like one, you know, like promo, you know what I mean? He went all over the board and I was like, wow, dude, yeah. this, this guy can act, you know. Yeah, he's definitely great. I mean, wasn't he yeah. like also in like uh was it he was in uh like uh a Mad Max, wasn't he? I think back in the day with, with Mel Gibson. Yeah. Yeah. He was the yeah. hot guy, yeah. He was also That's in awesome, uh, Power Rangers. Yeah, Power Rangers, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. awesome, dude. I mean, I and, think uh, that... As a part of... Go ahead. I bought an autographed photo from him from uh, Weird Science because it's like one of my favorite movies. And it's the part where, you know, Michael Anthony All has a gun to his face. And uh, uh-huh. and he wrote, uh, he's, he wrote, Larry, I'm, I'll do your effing promo. Put the gun down <laughs> and it's signed this for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing that I mean, I think that for people, sometimes people are kind of shy around, like, you know, people who are in movies or celebrities or wrestlers or whatever. They're a little bit like nervous or whatnot, but the, the most of them are the most down to earth, like, just good people out there, like, just real, like, just salt of the earth kind of folk. And uh, they're just there having a good time, and like you really can build a rapport with them. And some of them, like I said, like I was telling you before, I mean, I, I had their content info, and I would talk to them on a regular basis on the phone. Now, I also was running a, I was running a podcast back then, so there was a little bit of a, I scratch your back, you scratch my kind of thing going on. But you know, I just was very uh, impressed with how down to earth a lot of those guys are. And, you know, you're speaking to that as well. That they're just like good fun guys looking to have a fun, just looking to have to cut up and have a good time while they're just, you know, doing their thing. Yeah, that's that's what happened to Cage because, you know, we're set up at the same merch table and uh, you know, the show was kind of slow. I mean, he sold, you know, a few autographs and then he was just sitting around doing nothing. And uh, I just looked at him and I was like, you know, I, I thought about this scene for the movie and I was like, Cage, you want to be in a movie? He kind of laughs at me because... He's like, what, right now? I'm like, why not? I said, here's here's what I'm thinking about doing. If you want to do it, we can do it when the show's over, and we'll just, you know, sit here at the merch table. And then he's like, well, do you have, like, a script or some lines for me? And I was like, well, I said, your cage. I mean, I don't want to put anything in your mouth for you to say that, you know, your fandom you know, doesn't want to hear because, you know, you know what your fans want. So you can play it like a jerk, you can play it funny, you can play it play it however you want it. But I want you to be you because I don't want to be, you know, responsible for you losing your wrestling career by me making you say something stupid. You know what I mean? So just do what you need to do <laughs> and play how you want to right. play it. And he sure. did it perfect. Perfect. He's a true well, professional, I mean, like, really. Yeah, he's, a, he's great, man. I mean, I've never met him personally, but... I mean, he is just such, I mean, I've seen him do interviews as just his normal self, you know, just being, I'm not, I don't even know if his real name is Brian Cage or not, but just him not being the the wrestling Brian Cage. And he's like the most like down to earth, yeah. cool dude in the world, man. I mean, he really is. And, uh, but the dude is like, literally has muscles in places you didn't even know muscles existed. I mean, he is literally a brick house. Exactly. And like I said, I filmed, I have filmed uh, one or two of his matches. And uh, the dude can literally get from the top rope. He's, he's six foot three, probably 280, 300. But he can jump from the top rope, do a backflip onto like three guys on the ground. And it's just crazy watching. And I just watched the show. He was uh, doing that thing against Ryback the other night when I was talking to you about it. He did a three six nine or whatever that uh three one nine or three Mysterio dead. He, he did that on yeah, right back, you know? yeah. He's flew around. And, yeah, I was like, holy crap, dude! That's like a three hundred pound hundred doing this. Yeah, it's, he's just he's just amazing athlete. I mean, it's crazy. yeah, he's amazing. I mean, and then like you know, 
if you see him like on AEW, dude, he's just like, man, dude, he's, I mean, the way he throws people around, the way that, you know, he, like you said, he moves around himself. Most normal big guys cannot even do that. Oh, yeah, Ron, you got Booyaka Booyaka, yeah. 619, baby. Yeah, he even said, Ron goes, his veins have muscles. <laughs> That's true. That's so true. <laughs> so, so, so let me ask you, are you, are you, I know you said you did that a couple years ago. Are you always still looking for projects to do? Are you kind of past all that, or are you always on the lookout for an opportunity to film some uh, more stuff? I have a script right now that I'm writing, but since the COVID hit, I haven't really put much effort into it because sure. we were supposed to film it before COVID hit, but uh, I talked to my lead actor, and uh, he was getting ready to have to do like forced overtime for like six months. So we had to postpone it for that. And then when I got, when he got done with that, we decided to film it again. And then my lead girl calls me and says, I'm pregnant. So I can't film it. And I was like, ah. So then it's not your baby, though, is it? We were going to do it. And the code. What's that? It's not yours, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's good. That is good. So let me ask you this. Are you still before? I mean, do you, you said this is something that you kind of glossed over, but I think it's interesting. You said you were doing uh filmmaking or like uh camera work for independent wrestling, uh, promotions. How does one become a independent film promo or independent wrestling promotion film camera? And what does that look like? Uh, well, I, a, a friend of mine has a you know wrestling video production company, and uh, you know he would travel all over the country and film you know wrestling promotions shows for them, and you know build their okay. DVDs and stuff like that. And uh, you know me being kind of like a new filmmaker, it was kind of like. Uh, you know, he taught me how to like do some editing and, and, you know, it's kind of like one of those deals where I scratch your back, you scratch my back. So he helped me with, you know, getting the editing down and showing me how to edit and stuff. And, sure. uh, you know, I helped him film the shows because before he had these guys that had no idea what they're doing. Like me, I, I came from kind of, you know, like you know, I did a lot of filmmaking, like studying, like online and stuff. So I and I know some filmmaking theory. You know what I mean? So you know, you if you know some action is going to happen, you need to already have the camera where the action is going to be. You can't be all herky and jerky and it's going to look like crap. So you know, you have to be the easy flow and stuff. So he had to edit these other people's stuff so bad because he would just pick somebody out in the crowd and do it, and and his stuff looked like crap. You know, sure. and uh, when I started working for him, you know, he kind of, you know, told me what to do and what, what he needed out of me. And like I said, and I went a step further and filmed, you know, had good shots. I mean, almost like cinematic like shots, you know what I mean? And uh, right. and he would tell me like, like, man, he gets I could use almost use your footage for the whole show because you had it, you know, everything in frame and, you know, all the right angles and stuff. Uh, <laughs> I've got that my whole life, Kevin Smith. Everybody's like, oh, it looks like Kevin Smith. <laughs> I didn't think about that, but that's true. But yeah, it's like. So, so <laughs> what, like I said, so I, I had a lot, of, a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun Please. doing the doing the wrestling stuff. That was, I mean, it was just fun. You know what I mean? Oh, of course, I'm sure it was awesome. Can you talk about? Um, I mean, you talked about Brian Cage. Are there any other wrestlers that you saw kind of coming up, either that might be with WWE now or Ring of Honor or AEW or Impact or TNA that you saw kind of starting up that you were like, uh, this person has this person has something. They might be pretty good down the road. Britt Baker. Ooh. I think she Brent was Baker, just on AEW the other night. 
Yeah. I think that was her. Uh, she was awesome. I've, I've filmed her for the last few years. I mean, she was like, uh, I think five years ago, I think I started filming her. And I could tell like she had, she kind of had that it factor. I, I was surprised she wasn't signed long, you know, long ago because she's pretty awesome. Yeah. But she's, she's, she's awesome. in mind. Yeah, yeah, the, the ones that awesome. you know weren't already signed. I mean, of the independent guys, I, I filmed. You know, that's awesome, Brett Baker. Yeah, she's definitely. Uh, I'm gonna get. To, I get. A, I'm getting a chance to meet her next month. She's coming to Indianapolis for a big uh, wrestling convention, so I'm pumped to meet her there. Cool. Yeah, she's definitely. Yeah, she always, she's one of the. She did, uh, I filmed one of her matches. I remember it was a Halloween night. Uh, it's actually when they were having trick or treat, and it was her and uh, I think the other girl was like Raylene or Ray, Ray Lynn or something. Can't remember her name, but they put on such an awesome match, dude. It was it was great. I mean, they were both really good, and uh, the one girl was the like the bad girl, and she was like. You know, taking trick or treat candy away from the kids and stuff like that. It was pretty funny. And then Brett came out and she was giving candy to all the kids. You know, so you know, uh, other girl was getting some heat. Yeah, there you go. She definitely was. She's taking candy away. So he's always you, the best. Yeah. She. Have you ever? Did you see a couple yeah. weeks ago her and Thunder Rosa's uh, lights out match on AEW? No, but I heard Cornette talk about it. I uh, I need to oh, watch geez. it though. Yeah, don't listen. Sometimes to Jim I Cornette. listen to like, Cornette's podcast. Oh God, yeah, Jim Cornette, dude, the the Louisville Whip. <laughs> Lord have mercy, dude. But uh, yeah, don't don't let him tank. Actually, she wanted the I match is really good. good. No, nah, he he does, he he hates AC, ECW, and ECW is my favorite wrestling company. So, oh, you okay. know, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I love Lucha and stuff. He hates the high flying stuff, but I, I'm, yeah, like, like we talked about school. before, you know, I like everything. You know what I mean? People can like what sure. they like, and yeah, I can like it all. I mean, I can like old school wrestling. I can like high flying. I can like, you know, death matches or whatever. It doesn't matter if you put on a good show. Yeah. I don't care what it is. You know? Yeah, right and before, I like right, Jack. right before I hit New Jack. Oh my God. New Jack. <laughs> I don't know if I can like a new Jack match. That's too. That might be too much of a real thing for me. But, but yeah, it's definitely out there. It, it's it is a real thing. It, it was uh like my friend was like the indie guy that wrestled him years ago when I when I met him, and dude, yeah. they were just killing each other. I mean, they, there was no technical thing. They were just hitting each other with like you know VCRs and stabbing each other with forks and you know throwing each other into the stands or i mean just very you know painful stuff and after after the show and the promoter was freaking out he was because he was thinking lawsuits you know what i mean he was thinking you know injuries and yeah. insurance and and you know he was you could just tell he was like biting his nails he's like man he goes i didn't know they were going to do this i was like dude it was new jack what did you expect you know? Yeah, what the uh, what but, uh, world? Come on. Dude. Yeah, everybody lives. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. I'm glad. What do you expect? You're not, right. You're not you're not doing like the true E Hollywood really story. Did. Exactly. They like said it it did it, it was the only match well, I mean it's not the only match ever scared me when I was like eight or ten years old. I saw Abdullah the Butcher and the Sheik as a kid and they scared the crap out of me. But you know, those guys were rough and tough, you know, back in the 70s. Yeah. yeah. yeah that would scare me too, uh, the Sheik and Abdul the Butcher. That's a, that's a, that's a, not a, not a match for the faint of heart either. You're exactly right. Yeah, that was pretty, it was very bloody. <laughs> so, and, uh, so I obviously remember, you mentioned you were, you were, you said you were a wrestling fan from, you know, back in the day, ECW and maybe before that, even, I'm not for sure. So what were a few of your favorite wrestlers as you were either a youngster growing up or as an ECW fan were like, what are some of the favorite wrestlers that you have uh, 
a strong connection with? Uh, when I was a kid, I was into like Georgia Championship Wrestling uh, mm-hmm. back in the seventies, and uh, right. I, some of my favorite wrestlers like Tony Atlas and the Road Warriors were on there, and Magnum TA. Yeah, uh, you know some of those guys. Uh, Tommy Rich. Like, I went and saw Tommy Rich fight uh, Ric Flair, like, in 81 for the championship. And that was, they, that <laughs> was a bloody Georgia? mess. They went on for, like, an hour, dude, and they were just bloody. It was it was nuts. That is. That's crazy. Man, that'd be nuts. I think I was, like... And I, I filmed Tommy Rich. He's one of the legends that... uh. I like filmed back in the day. He was probably my favorite wrestler as a kid. Like, you know, and then like I said, Road Warriors were my favorite tag team. And uh, like I said, I like Tony Atlas a lot. And I got to film him too years later. Uh, I, I filmed a lot of Hall of Famers and legends and stuff. That, that was one of the things I really liked about the job. And, and the thing about it is when you, when you work for the companies and you get to come in you know, a couple hours ahead of time and you stay a couple hours later, you know, tearing things down and talking to people and stuff, you know, you're kind of like one of the boys, you know what I mean? You're kind of like in the group. You're kind of, you know, you, you get to see and, and talk to people and, and, you know, they treat you differently than the marks because, you know, you're, you're in on it. You know what I mean? You're part of the crew. You're, you know, and it was cool. They, they all, you know, accepted me pretty well and stuff. It was cool. That is awesome. That's super, super awesome. I mean, for sure. So, I mean, so you said you talked about some of the guys from the seventies and the eight or in the eighties. So, what about ECW? Like, what are some of your favorite wrestlers from that promotion? Because that was more of a nineties, early, early two thousands yeah. kind of like you know, two uh, of a baby with uh, with uh, Paul H- Heyman and all that. So, what were some of your favorite wrestlers there? I would say uh, Sabu and uh, Van Dam. Oh, yeah. And Who's going into the WWE the- Hall of Fame this year? Can you believe that? Who is it? Van Rob Dam? Van Dam's going to the Yeah, Van Dam's going to the Hall of Fame this year. It's crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. He deserves it. I mean, he was good. I, I don't think oh, he did, sure. get into a whole lot in WC or WWF because Vince didn't let him do anything. <laughs> right. So you said Sabu and RVD. Anybody else from the ECW days? Well, New Jack. I New like Jack. Him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think uh, like Mankind wrestled in WCW, like against Cactus Jack or something. Yeah, I always yeah, loved Cactus. Cactus. Jack I loved him back in. The day. Yeah, I loved him back in the day when he was like wrestling in like. Uh, AWA Bang, or, yeah. or Greg Gagne. Yeah. Or something, you know? yeah. Now, one of the best matches I've ever seen in history, and you know, Hell in a Cell or whatever, where he went through the cage and stuff. Oh yeah, that was one of the most memorable matches. Of, you know, oh, and dude, I, mean, I had a lot of respect that, for him. You know, yeah, the stuff that Mick Foley did to his body for. Everybody else's amusement and entertainment is legendary. Yeah. Yeah, it was nuts. Dude, yeah. He, he I, you may not have seen it, but uh, Britt Baker cut a promo about two weeks ago and about her de- about her no lights, you know, match that she did with Thunder Rosa, and she she threw uh, <laughs> Mick Foley under the table or under the bus, and like she goes. He spent he spent twenty years becoming a hardcore legend. I had one match, and I'm a hardcore legend. <laughs> that was like, oh my god! <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. It was so. And then like Mick Foley responded, like it's all in kayfabe, which is I feel like kind of dying, unfortunately, because everything's about you know being yeah. on the internet and TV and all that. So the kayfabe is kind of disappearing. It's no longer an art form. It's hard to find wrestlers who will stick to it. Right. Yeah, one of the so, stories we heard from Hacksaw was when he got caught, you know, he got caught drunk driving with uh, 
uh, Iron Sheik. And uh, they got fired because not because he got caught for drugs and he got caught and she got caught for drugs, but uh, they got caught because they broke kayfabe. They weren't supposed to be together. Right. So that's why they got fired. Yeah. <laughs> I never never really knew that. <clears throat> yeah, because heels and baby faces can't be seen in public together. Right. Yeah, it, it breaks. Yeah, it breaks back the, then. The, uh, the kayfabe. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, you know it's weird because I don't know if you want. I don't. Maybe you don't. You don't probably. I'm like I'm from pretty. I'm a I'm a pretty big uh, AEW mark now. Like I'll be the first one to admit. Like I I just love AEW, and so I watch a lot of the guys YouTube. Uh, a lot of the guys who do YouTube channels, I watch a lot of their channels, and it's funny because like you'll have Miro who went by Rusev in WWE, but now his real name is Miro. That's what that's who he is in AEW, and he'll like he'll cut a promo. On, you know, whoever like the the the, uh, the best friends or Orange Cassidy, and talk about how he's gonna destroy them, and then like the next time you see him, he's like playing like Twitch or some video games, and he's like joking around with everybody, and it's just like, you know, it's just it's hard to see him as a serious destroyer of men when he's like playing video games and talking right. to his buddies all the time. It just kind of takes away from it. <laughs> right. Yeah, because before there was a curtain. You couldn't see behind the curtain. Right. Yeah. So the his, internet killed a lot of stuff. All right. Ron Figo here said RVD and Sabu got pulled over for smoking weed. And he goes, I wish I was with them. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do, Ron. <laughs> but most definitely. So I met, did uh, you, did you, I met RVD. Oh, I was at the National Sports Card Convention. Rob, yeah, Rob Van Dam. He he walked by. He was he's like, hey man, you know where the bathroom is? And I was like, yeah, it's right over there. I said, hey, when you come back, can I get a photo with you? And he's like, oh man, I don't have time for that. And uh, he went and took a whiz and came back, took a photo with me. Like, oh, I'm sorry, man. I'll, I'll take a photo with you. <laughs> so he was cool. You're like, I hope you wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, met, uh, oh yeah, I forgot. I met Trish Ron, Stratus. Yeah, Ron. You met Trish Stratus? Nice. Yeah, I met her that day. Trish was hot. Yeah, she was. She's smoking. Dude. She's still hot. She's still hot now. I I always liked. Uh, I met her too. I'm uh, Stacy Keebler. She was always my favorite. I met her a couple times. She, was she was, hanging uh, out with George cool. Clooney. At the time, she was dating David Flair, and he was a jerk. I actually wrote two autograph books. Yeah, I actually wrote two autograph books, and uh, I have a story in there about you know the Ric Flair and Stacy Keebler. Uh, I was, you know, I asked him for an autograph, and he's like, "We ain't got time for that shit." And I was like, uh, "Okay." And then I asked her, and she's like, "Yeah, sure." And she grabs my index card and was going to sign it for me. He's like, he took it out of her hands. Like, I told you, we ain't got time for that. And then I was like, then I asked Stacy. I said, "Well, Stacy, can, can I get a picture with you?" She's like, "Sure." And he's like, "Said we ain't got time. Let's go." And I had the same thing happen to me with Miss Elizabeth and Lex Luger too. Uh, Lex was a jerk. Really? But Miss Elizabeth was awesome. Yeah, you could tell Miss Elizabeth was almost in tears because you know he she didn't he wouldn't let her sign or take a picture with me. Yeah, she was she yeah, was, she heard, seemed like she was really that, super nice. Yeah, I she heard that she was like her last couple of years were awful. I bet. Oh yeah, she's yeah. smoking. Rob said be hanging out with Yoko. Maria, uh, one of my worst. I, I've done some signings with like wrestlers, like uh, Nikita Koloff came to my store and signed autographs. He was really cool. Nice. Uh, I had Brian Christopher come to my store and sign autographs, and he was he was kind of a super douche. Uh, Who was this? He, uh, Brian Christopher, big sex a. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, okay. Lord's uh, son that died. Uh, he was a super douche. He really was. 
Brian, he, he was supposed to sign like two hundred. Yeah, he was supposed to sign two hundred and fifty autographs for me. That was the agreement because I was paying him X right. amount of money, and I said I'll pay you, this, but I want two hundred fifty autographs. And he agreed to it. Then when he got there, he signed like a hundred autographs for me, and he just sat there for two hours and didn't do anything else. And then I told him, I said, well, we really need to get the rest of these autographs signed because, you know, I didn't pay you all this money to sign 100 photos. And he's like, what do you mean, man? He goes, I've already sold like 2500 or signed $2,500 worth of photos for you. And I'm like, dude, I can't sell all these to your mom because she's the only one that would pay $25 for your autograph. Where do you come up with your prices? I can't sell these for $25 a piece. I was, right. like, I was like, you need to sign those autographs. So after pulling teeth, I finally got like 150 of the autographs, you know. But oh my gosh, what in the world? That's I, crazy, dude. But yeah, and then he got mad because he had to sign the extra autographs and he missed his flight. <laughs> I was like, well, if he would have signed the autographs to begin with, we wouldn't have had to miss your flight. So he was trying right, to get that's me to all on, yeah, pay that's for all the flight. Here. I was like, no. Yeah, I was like, I don't think that's so, dude. But, that's hilarious, man. That yeah, is I filmed, hilarious. I filmed, him, I filmed like two or three of his matches, too. And then there was one match that the, the whole uh, Scotty Too Hot thing was there, too. Yeah, the whole team. Was, have, you ever, have, you, have you ever been fun. around any of the uh, – have you ever, have you ever uh, filmed or been around any of the guys that were uh, – WCW guys that were big time, but WCW guys there for a while. Uh, like the like the Conan uh, or anything like that. I met Conan, but I didn't film him. Uh, I've met Vampiro. I've met uh, you know, Piper. Like I, I went to the, the. What was nice about WCW is those guys all stayed in the same hotel. So when I used to chase uh, autographs, you know, we would just find the hotel they were staying at and we'd do pretty well. And uh, I think you're froze up. Oh, there you are. <laughs> but we would uh, get all the guys at the hotel. I met Virgil a few times. I was set up beside him at a baseball card show and he used my all my battery on my phone calling it. <laughs> Seriously? But I met Chris Benoit. I met uh Brett the Hitman Hart, uh Lance Storm That's Canyon, awesome. uh Rick Steiner, Scott Steiner, Booker T, Stevie Ray, Disco Inferno, nice. Harlem uh, Ray Mysterio. Uh, Without the mask. Who else? There was so many. Yeah. Yeah, I got a picture with uh, Ray Mysterio without his mask. Nice. So you got a picture with Oscar. Saturn. Uh, got Flair and Buff Bagwell. Uh, Buff. Everybody. It's just... Uh, list of who's who, you know? That is so cool, dude. I That's met Kane really, really like... Awesome. You know, when when Kane just first got you know had the mask, it was probably like his first couple weeks. He uh, was in the elevator. I saw him at the airport. I was getting ready to fly back to Ohio and Florida, and I saw this great big dude. And he went down to grab like a piece of luggage, and just the muscle in his arm. I looked at the muscle in his arm, and I looked at him. I was like, "You're a wrestler, aren't you?" He's like, yeah. He goes, I bet you can't guess what wrestler I am, can you? I was like, give me a minute. Let me look at your face. And I didn't recognize him. I'm like, I looked at his arm again, and I'm like, you're Kane, aren't you? He's like, how did you know I was Kane? No one has ever recognized me because I wear the mask. And I was like, well, when you picked up your luggage, I could tell your arm and just your muscle structure. I could tell you were Kane from like when you were giving choke slams or whatever. You know what I mean? Wow. He's like, that's awesome. He goes, you want an autograph? I was like, I don't have anything here at the airport. He goes, you want to get your picture with me? I think that's like, I don't have a camera. I'm sorry, dude. I just, I'll shake your hand. How's that? <laughs> you know? 
You should have like I was flying back to uh, sign my chest back to Ohio. <laughs> and all my... Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I didn't even have a Sharpie on me, you know. Normally <laughs> and after that day, you know, normally like I said I chased autographs back then. And normally I had like an index book and a Sharpie and a disposable camera on me at all times. And I put all that stuff in my bag, not thinking, you know, I'm going to run into somebody at the airport. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I ran into Sandy Koufax randomly at the airport. It, it was crazy. Oh, that's... Yeah. Then, uh, oh, Sandy yeah, Koufax, Yankum. dude. Isaac Yankum when he played the dentist. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That, that, that we, uh, gimmick was awful. Yeah. He never would have been anything with that gimmick. No, I'm glad he went to mankind. You know, mankind. I'm glad he went to Kane. I randomly ran into uh, Jim Neighbors at uh, the airport one time. Jim Neighbors, that's awesome. Sandy Koufax and Jim yeah. Neighbors in the airport. I was like, holy cow, you're Jim Neighbors. He's like, well, holy. <laughs> that's awesome, dude. Yeah, we used to go to the airport. We used to go to the airports and, and camp out there like on a Monday the week before the Super Bowl and just all kinds of people. Hey, what's up, Isaac? Uh, you know, all kinds of people would just show up, you know what I mean? Mm. And all celebrities and stuff. That's so cool, dude. That is awesome, man. That's really, really cool that you had the yeah, opportunity we- to run into all these characters over the years. Without a doubt. So I met Wayne NSYNC man. when they played the Super Bowl. <laughs> NSYNC. Bye, 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 dude. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. I, that, that I, I asked, thing, uh, right? like, Joey Fatane and, and Lance Bass for walking by, and I, I asked Joey for an autograph, and Lance is like, yeah, sure, and I'm like, sorry, buddy, not you, him. <laughs> I don't want your autograph. Isaac, I got 43 today. And he's like, huh, uh, and just walks off. <laughs> yeah, I'd be the same way, dude. I'd be so like, Justin I'm Timberlake I'm probably walked away. Yeah. If we know what we know now, I definitely would have been a Justin Timberlake uh, autograph uh, go getter at that moment. Exactly. You know, back then I probably wouldn't have known any better. But exactly. in fact, you know, now I've been like, definitely Justin Timberlake. So, man, oh, man, dude. That, that, that is day, wild. Uh, same day I saw. The same day Christina Aguilera came off the plane too, she wouldn't sign or take any pictures or anything. Oh man! I tell you, women are hard to recognize when they got their sunglasses on and their hats on and stuff, trying to be incognito. They're kind of hard to recognize. Yeah, I, yeah, I would I'm rather sure try to. They probably got down to a I science. can pick out dudes. Yeah, because well, every girl looks the same with shades and a hat on. And they're yeah, that's true. Yeah, I had a friend of mine who uh, lived in Los Angeles, and he went to uh, he went to a theater out in L.A. I don't know what theater it was, but it was a theater like you know that's not like this like in the city, but one of the on the outskirts or whatever. You know, maybe not as busy. And he said he was standing in line to get tickets to a movie, and there was a guy in front of him. He had like big black sunglasses and a hat pulled down. You know, like a polo shirt, whatever. He just kind of had his head down, and he was standing in line in front of him. And uh, they, you know, it was a, and, and they had to keep waiting and waiting and waiting. And then they realized he turned around because you know he was just like looking around, I guess, waiting. And he turned around, and it was Leonardo DiCaprio just trying to get like get a ticket, and no one, you know, <laughs> he was trying to he trying not to get caught. You know, he's just like, you know, trying to look, you know. But like you said, as soon as people recognized who he was, he had to get out of there because guys, it's hard. It's hard to hide if you're a dude, but uh, you know the girl, like you're like no makeup, yeah. hat, put a pulled their hair back, big old glasses. No one's even gonna pay attention. But you know, you know DiCaprio has a very unique look, so he was he was hard to hide himself. So he said he ended up having you know to take who, off. Uh, and then... You know who Faith Hill is, right? Faith, oh yeah, I know Faith Hill. Yeah, not personally. Faith Hill. But I know her. I met I met her with Tim McGraw at a charity baseball game. 
Tim McGraw oh, is yeah? the nicest guy in the world. He wasn't too pleasant, you know. And uh, I met nice Tim McGraw too. Wasn't. That was his dad. Yeah, he was a baseball player. He was super nice. I mean, um, yeah, his dad was really nice too. So Faith wasn't not so was not was not so nice. I see Ron Fig met Bill Clinton and Ali. Yeah, I met uh, George Bush people. Senior and uh, I met I met Trump back when he was just a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> this when he just a billionaire. That's it. Yeah. Oh, that'd be awesome, like, dude. Me. I don't know, 90. It was like 98, maybe, when I met him, or somewhere near. That's awesome, dude. That's, it always is cool to meet yeah, people. We had, like him that. Sign, we had him signing 25 bills. You had a what? We also met a. You met who? It's cutting out. We also met Charles Schultz that day. Charles Schultz. He was the oh, Charles uh, Schultz, yeah. creator of Peanuts, Charlie Brown. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, we met him, too. He was he, he was playing the same uh, pro-am as Trump, and uh, uh, there were some other people there, too. I can't remember. <laughs> Secret Service didn't like me, either. Yeah. The, day, the day I met Bush Sr., uh, I ended up getting 18 autographs of Bush that day. And I kind of wow. found out, like, if you if you would run up to Bush right off the bat, security, like, the Secret Service would kind of, like, knock you down, and you couldn't get to him. But if you was, like, the second or third guy, you'd be the first guy to him. So I would always make sure I would, you know, let everybody else run up there, and then I would just go to, to Bush and get an autograph. And like I said, I got them 18 times and 18 holes. And uh, I needed a car at the time because my car was kind of, you know, a crappy car. I sold those 18 autographs for 100 bucks a piece the next day. So got the $1,800 wow. for those. <laughs> Man, cool. I wonder how much you get for so it now. Isaac, That's crazy. Isaac said, tell the Jeter story, I think. Yeah. yeah, Jeter was cool. I met him several. He, he, uh, I met him when he was a rookie, and uh, he signed like eighteen cards for me right off the bus. And then, like during, like before the game, he signed uh, a team, like a ball for me. I was getting the whole team on, and he looked and saw I didn't have everybody. So he's like, "Hey, let me take this in the dugout and get everybody for you." I'm like, "Oh, okay." So he got everybody wow. before me, and then I took the ball to the like to the bullpen because there was some people over there I hadn't got, and there was this young kid sitting on a chair, and his number wasn't in the the book, you know. I, and I asked him, I said, "Are you a player or do you, are you a manager? I mean, do you play on the team?" And he he's like, "No, I'm nobody." And I'm like, "I don't know, man. You wouldn't be, you wouldn't have a uniform on if he was nobody. You have to be somebody." He's like, no, I'm nobody. I was like, well, Mr. Nobody, could you sign my ball, please? So he signed my, my ball for me. And then after the game, you know, I saw Jeter again, and I said, hey, man, there's a lineup card in there. The manager you know, writes all the stuff on. And I was like, what do they do with those? He goes, well, they just throw them away. Do you want it? I'm like, yeah, sure. If you give it to me, that'd be great. So I ended up getting Jeter to sign that and everybody else to sign it when they were leaving to get on the bus. And then the 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 young kid that I saw earlier, I got him to sign it too. I was like, hey, can you sign my card for me too? He's like, yeah, sure. So years later, you know, Jeter became, you know, famous, you know, with the, with the Yankees. So I was like, I'm going to go look at that ball that I got signed. I started looking at it and I recognized another autograph on there. That young kid that said he was nobody was Morano Rivera. Yeah, so, I knew it was coming. That's so been, cool. That's so cool. If I wouldn't have been, like, you know, pushing him, he wouldn't have signed it for me, you know. But he signed a lineup card, too. I got the lineup card out, and I'm like, holy crap, man. Morano Rivera right there. And uh, it was awesome. 
And then we that met, is awesome, met him once at an airport. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes you know, we'd have flight information. We'd know like when people were coming in to the sure. airport, and we know what gate they're at and stuff. This, and you used to be able to get to the gate. This is when, you know, we sat there at like gate C and as soon as he walked off the gate, we knew, you know, he, we could get him. So we get to like gate C and it just looks, it looks like a normal busy airport, you know, and I'm looking around. I don't see like a bunch of like, you know, what I would call graphers, you know, I don't see a people with a bunch of baseballs and a bunch of like eight by tens in their hand or, or card binders. So I thought, Oh dude, we're the only ones that have this information. You know, when Jeter comes off this plane, we're going to kill this guy. You know, we're going to get like 50 or 100 autographs. You know, we're going to do great. Well, as soon as Jeter comes walking off the plane, every single person in the airport gets up and is grabbing shit out of their bags. <laughs> so there's like 400 autograph people, dude. It was like everybody just starts running and they're like cockroaches. I was like, oh, man, are you kidding? <laughs> so That's I ended awesome. up getting autographs. Autographs. And I got a picture with him that day, but dude, he signed five autographs and took about five pictures and he was done. He's like, I'm done guys. There's, there's too many of you. Like I said, there's literally 400 people. It was crazy. Oh my gosh. That's but awesome, he, dude. That's so cool. He's one, of the coolest dudes. one of the coolest dudes. He seems like a very cool guy. Yeah. Well, awesome. One of my coolest, like, like most strange, you know, things that I've, I've ran into uh, during the Super Bowl, I think it was 98 or something like that, when it was in Atlanta. It, it was the year that oh, Ray Lewis got arrested for murder. Nice. I met Ray seven hours before he was arrested, six hours. Spent like 45 what? minutes with him, just sitting at his table. BSing. Yeah. It, nobody showed up for the signing. So I'm just sitting there talking to Ray like you and I are sitting here talking. Man. I'm sitting there sitting right beside him. He's like, yeah, he goes, come on beside me and just sit here and talk if you want. I was like, all right, cool, man. So the the event place let him go after 45 minutes of the signing. He was supposed to be there two hours. And he had already signed all my stuff. He signed like 18 autographs for me. He signed all my footballs. I had some cards. I had some 8 by 10s of them. He signed everything. And uh, the guy told him he could leave. And... I saw like a stack of, I can't remember how many photos, like 15 photos or 20 photos or something sitting there. And I asked the guy, I said, what are you going to do with those photos now that Ray's gone? You know, you didn't have him sign them. He's like, well, we're just going to throw them away. If you want them, you can have them. So I swooped them up and I ran outside real quick to try to get Ray to sign them for me. And he was, he just got in the stretch limo. It was a big Escalade stretch limo. It was pretty awesome. And there was a guy that was still outside and uh, I asked, I was like, Ray, Ray, Mr. Lewis, Mr. Lewis, could you sign my photos for me, please? And his buddy's like, man, he's done with that crap. We're getting out of here. So his buddy jumped in and they shut the door. And I thought I was done, you know, because the door's shut and they're probably getting ready to take off. Here comes the other door opening. And here comes Ray Lewis coming out, you know, fixing his, his sports coat. And he's like, hey, man, what can I help you with? I was like, hey, these guys were just going to throw those photos away. And I hate to see good photos go to waste. I said that either you can have them or could you sign them for me? You know, one or the other guys, because I'm just going to throw them away. If you're not going to sign them, you can just have them, you know, and give them to people or whatever. He's like, no, man, I'll sign them for you. That's cool. So he signed 20 more photos for me, you know, eight by 10. Wow. So he's just a cool dude, man. And then, like I said, later on, I saw ESPN where they're, they're dragging that, you know, Escalade on ESPN. I was like, man, that looks familiar. And then I turn up the volume, and they're like, Ray Lewis arrested for murder. I was like, man, I was just there with them. I was like, holy crap. You know, it was crazy. Wow. And the knife was bought at that authority that I was there. He had like seven or eight friends with him. And as I was sitting there with him, he told his friends, because his friends were behind him in some chairs, and he told his friends, he's like, hey, guys, if you want to go out and buy some stuff, you know, here's my credit card. Uh, just buy you guys, you know, don't go crazy, but, you know, buy you guys something, hundred dollars, whatever, you know. Uh, and they went out and bought some stuff. The one guy bought the knife there. So that's how he got oh. sucked into it because he, he bought the murder weapon, you know. But, uh, oh, my gosh. Dude. Yeah, like I've had a lot, of, that's crazy. a lot of cool experiences. Like I said, I've had, I've had more experiences than, you know, most people. <laughs> I'd say so, dude. That's crazy, you know, man. 
I haven't done them like like here in my hometown. I've had to travel. You know, I used to travel to every sure. Super Bowl and travel to every our game, and we went to the Masters. You know, a few years and you know, just pretty much anywhere and everywhere. But now, have you have you shared these fun. these stories on your own video on your own channel? Uh, right now, I have a thing called Story Time, and I think um, I'm up to like number eight. I've done the Jeter story. I've done the Ray Lewis story. Uh, I think yesterday I launched the Kevin Mitchell story. Uh, here's the Kevin Mitchell story. It's pretty awesome. Uh, I used to go to Tidewater and uh, watch the Tidewater Tides, like Virginia Beach. My dad was stationed down there, and uh, like I said, they were. My mom and dad's been divorced since I was like four. So when I was like twelve. You know, my dad would have me for like two weeks out of the year and uh, we'd go watch a bait, you know, some baseball games in those two weeks because I loved baseball at the time. And uh, and it started about 82. So from 82 to like 88 is when I watched the tides. So I got to see all those awesome, you know, Mets players come through. And, sure. I, and about 84, it's like 84, 85. You know, I saw this young shortstop. He was like six foot, 225 pound shortstop. And it was Kevin Mitchell. And I kind of liked him because I was, you know, at the time I was like 13 years old and I was six foot, 225 pounds. I was a big kid. So I was like, oh, cool. This guy is built like me and he's playing shortstop. You know, you don't see shortstops that are like thick, yeah. you know, but his was muscle. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that's why I first started liking him. But then, he got hit by a pitch and the catcher went to try to, you know, grab him and he elbowed the catcher in the face and knocked him out. I mean, literally the dude's laying on the ground and then the first baseman <laughs> comes and tries to get him, pitches out the first baseman, knock cold cocks him, knocks him out. He's laying, he's not moving. Third baseman comes, he knocks out the third baseman. Literally he's laying on the ground too. The shortstop comes, he, he cold cocks, every single person and knocks him out. The the Mets come out or the Tides come out to try to help him and they don't even get past the white line. Every single one of them are stopped at the white line because I guess if you go over the white line, you get fined or you get like in trouble or something. They just went to the white line and stopped and they just, their jaws are like, oh, I can't believe they beat up the whole team. The pitcher took off and jumped over the, the center field fence and the outfielders <laughs> were running but the outfield stopped after they saw like four or five bodies on the ground and the bench cleared to go help and by the time they got to the white line they stopped too because they didn't want to get crap beat out of them and they were just like in awe because Kevin Mitchell just knocked out like four dudes I mean it was, oh like, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen and he became oh my, my favorite player you know, I mean you I, should I, you always see those baseball brawls What is it? Uh, it brings it brings a whole new meaning to slugger. Yeah, exactly. But then I I read wow. in Sports Illustrated like years later that he grew up in a like a tough neighborhood in San Diego and had to fight like every day. So I guess he you know had a tough bringing up and he was a tough dude, you know. I'm bad. He definitely knew how to fight. <laughs> I'd say so, dude. Yeah, I would I say, do. I would say so, dude. Wow, that's crazy, man. Well, 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 well I don't want to get to you, Isaac. Get out of there. Well, hey, Larry, I, I'm gonna go ahead. I will go ahead and stop it there. That was a good one to stop on. I mean, that's a heck of a story. I don't want to take too much of your time. We're already at like an hour and 15, 16 minutes. But I really want to say thank you for doing this, man. You have so many great yeah, stories. No we can do this again, maybe down the road in a week or two, if you want to do it again. So, whatever, I'm free. I don't since this COVID is around, I don't do anything. I <laughs> stay at home and work. You know, that's about it. You well, know, there you the, go. Do the eBay thing. Sure. Like I, said, I, well, I can get to those piles back there. <laughs> yeah, like all that pile, yeah, all that stuff back there, dude. That's true. There's a lot of stuff back there to go through. Yeah, like yeah, I got I got I'll, ten six foot. Miles. That's that. 
Yeah, you'll definitely be busy. That's for sure. You'll never got any downtime. If you think I TTM a lot, you should see me at the thrift stores buying stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, that's nuts, dude. It's nuts. Yeah, I, I think I had a lot in my garage, but you definitely got me beat. That's for sure. Yeah, like I said, I, I probably have – oh, during the pandemic when we were shut down for like two months here, I don't know if you guys were, but I was shut down for two months in, in Ohio. And uh, Sure. I couldn't source anymore. So I, I thought I had tons of extra stuff and come to find out I had two months worth of stuff because like that week before seven weeks worth of stuff, because that last week I was like listing trash. I pretty much had nothing to list. I was completely out. If they wouldn't have opened up the, the state, I probably would have pretty much not had anything to list and been done, you know? So wow. after they opened up for the past year, I just been buying and buying and buying and buying and buying. <laughs> I'm never going to be without stuff again, you know? So, cause I kept, you know, they kept saying, you know, during the election that the country might be shut down again and all that crap. So I just, you know, as a reseller, I wanted to be prepared if it did, sure. you know, Better, sorry, you know, and now, now you're set for life, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> well, well th thanks again, Larry, for hopping on and uh, hanging out today. I look forward to doing it again, and I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day. No problem, no problem dude. Like I, I said, uh, I'll send, I haven't got, those, uh, movies, haven't got those movies out to you yet, but I'll get them to you. Yep, no problem, man. It's totally fine, man. I look forward to it. No rush. Cool. Hopefully right, you man. enjoy it. We'll see you. <laughs> yeah, I look, I'm looking forward right, to later, it. Man. Totally looking forward to it. All, All right, right, man. Cool. Bye now.